All right. Good morning. How many of you like fishing? You like to fish. You like to fish? You like to fi- like, yeah, I like my story uh, kind of just made me think of this. It was uh, my daughter. She's like, I- I'm, this guy asked me to go fishing with him. I said, oh, yeah? Where? Because where you, wherever you go fishing, you got to have a license. Do you have a license? And she's like, no. I was like, well, where are you going to go fishing at? She goes, well, he, they got a big pond or a, 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 a thing of water in front of their church. At their church, I said, oh, then you won't need no license because you can, it's pr- private property. But if you go fishing anywhere else with this boy, you better have a license because they're going to take your car. They're going to take everything. You're going to find you. You get caught with no license. Yeah. <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> they can do that. They can do that. They can, but they don't. Yeah. You know, so. But, you know, so it's, a, you know, today we're going to be kind of just hitting on this uh, fishing. Do you like the fishing? It, it, the Bible it has, it's pretty kind of, pretty cool. Is it, look at uh, uh, the 12 disciples, seven out of 12 disciples were fishermen. So it's almost like fishing is a sport. It's a biblical sport. So it's no wonder there's so many people like to fish. They really love it. I, I, myself, I don't know why I can never really, I, I, I'm okay with it, but it's something that just, I, there's no real desire or drive like I'm going fishing this weekend. I'll see you later, babe. We're out of here. I'm going fishing. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I just don't, I just don't, I don't know what it is. But there's a lot of people that love fishing. They really do. Like this guy here. And that this story that, that this guy, him and his buddy were out fishing on the ocean, you know, and so they're they're on their way back for a long day fishing. It's towards a, a sun starting to set, and so they're on their way back to the marina, you know, and they're driving their boat. Wah, wah, wah. How many of you ever been on a boat doing like that? Somebody's got it floored down there. You know, yeah, I remember the first time I ever drove a boat. You know, I was like, "Just go faster, Daddy." I'm like, "Yes, okay, here we go." Wah, wah, wah. We're hitting those waves. Somebody's coming by, you know, and he started bouncing around there. Well, that's what they're kind of doing. They're heading back to the marina. You know, and they're just kind of just hanging out, just talking about their day of, of fishing. And all of a sudden, the one guy goes, hey, 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 slow down. And he's going, look, and just right off the marina's over there, but just, so, just enough off of the marina, you could see out towards the horizon, there was a boat. And, and right behind the boat, there's this guy, he's swimming. And this guy, and they're looking at you, go, that guy is crazy. Because earlier that day, while they were fishing, they saw shark as big as tractor trailers out there where they were at. And it was like, you got to be crazy swimming in this water at dusk at that, because that's the most time when they're going to hit, you know? And so he, and he goes, let's go by and swing by and make sure everything's okay over there. So they swing, whoa, they turn around there, and they hit it, and they go over there, and they slow down, and they pull up there. And sure enough, they pull up to the guy, and the guy's leaning over the boat, and he's looking down there, and he's going, this guy's drowning, man. And right in the middle of this guy drowning, they pull up to the side of him, and they go over there to try to pull him out, and they're looking at this guy. This guy's like 6'7", 300 and some pounds. He's a huge man. So he's like, you know, you got to help me pull this guy in there. So their boat was only just a little 16-footer boat. It was not that big of a boat. So they're trying to pull this big old guy in there. Water's pouring into the side because they're trying to pull this guy in there. And they finally get him in there. He's going all crazy. He's, he's just, he's like trying to catch his breath, you know. And so finally things calm down a little bit. And, he goes, and the one guy's like, man, what happened? What, what, why are you out there swimming around in the water? He goes, well, I was fishing and I leaned over the boat and I fell in. And so as I went to turn around to grab the boat, the wind blew and pushed the boat away from him. And ever since then, he'd been trying to catch the boat. And he was just like, he was, and and it was just like, he couldn't get in. He just could not get in. And that was his story. So they drove over to the boat and they helped the guy go over to the, into his boat. And he's like, you know, wow, well, that was a, that was a trip, you know, so they start heading back into the marina, you know, wah, wah, you know, this is their story, you know, so, and so he's going back to the marina, and in that, they, they come up on there, they slow down, you know, and in the marina, if you know anything about marinas, there's a lot of, a lot of boats that are just sitting there, they're just docked up, you know, nobody ever uses them, you know, and, but in a lot of the marina areas, that the boats are very expensive, the boats cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and so in that, they're, they're taking the, 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 the slow route going in there, and they're looking around there, and all of a sudden they see this one boat, it, it, this boat was a, a big old white boat, 
And all of a sudden, this dude walks to the, the back side of the boat, man, ripped. I'm talking 12-pack, big old arms, walking around like this, suntan. He's got all nice tan and everything, just a massive man. And, and, and all of a sudden, this woman comes out right, right beside him, and, and she had a bikini on. There was more cotton in a, a bottle of aspirin than was on her. That's just their story, not mine. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and so in that they're waving at them they're, as they're driving in towards the to, to dock you know and they're out there waving just waving and waving to them you know and smiling and all of a sudden he goes like this and he smacks her on the backside and, and then walks away all of a sudden you know the thought about it is 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 in they were talking for a minute there that there was a guy drowning within eye shot and ear shot of the marina. And all these people were doing, just sitting back, partying, having a good time, smacking each other on the butt, and not worried about there's people within their sight drowning and going to die. This story is a lot like the church. A lot of times, like with the church, is that we're sitting and just doing our lives. We're tied up to the docks, you know, and just hanging out at the church. And we're going home and just hanging out at home. We do our job at work and we go and do and that's like that. And within eye shot and earshot of people all around us are drowning and dying and going to hell. Our sermon title today is The Drowning Need Rescued. The Drowning Need Rescued. To think about how churches, our church, or the churches around us, or maybe somewhere where you came from, think about that we're a lot like these people here, sitting on a boat, watching people drown and die, going deep, deep into the, to the waters. For our, our case, it would be a place called hell, which is real. And we're so busy about having fun, patting each other on the backside, sipping some cheer wine or some sun drop or some Coke and more ice, please, that we are forgetting what Jesus came for. See, Jesus is all about the rescue. Jesus is all about those that, that are drowning. And, and, and if you remember back, maybe some of you that were saved, some of you are saved, you remember back when Jesus found you and he rescued you. Remember your story of where you were at and the bad things that were happening to you. And all of a sudden when you met Jesus, the weight that was lifted because he pulled you out of the drowning situation that you were at. Jesus is all about the rescued. But it seems as though the people that have been rescued have forgotten that. And the people around you are drowning and they're dying and, and you're, you're just, you've lost sight of what Jesus had planned for you to do. You see, Jesus is about radically rescuing and rescuing radically. He's looking for people that, that they were the greatest stories, you know, that, that, that you hear about what happened to them and how they got saved, it seems as though those stories are the ones that are reaching out to others and they're getting saved from that story. There was a radical rescue here. And in that story, they were able to rescue radically because of the, the heart of the passion. The story we're, we're, we're going to read from, we're going we're gonna to get here, is, and in Matthew, we're going to read Matthew chapter 28. 19 through 20, it says this. It says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus is all about rescuing people. And in so much, he wants to teach those that have been rescued his way. And in that, that way, they will be able to rescue others. In this, this word here, he says in the, uh, the word go. This is really cool. In the, in the original language, this word go means as you're going. 
It is a verb. It's a motion. So what Christ is saying, this is Jesus speaking. What Christ is saying, he is saying, get your as in gear. What did he just say? That's what I just said. As you are going, we are set back watching people. She's loving that one. <laughs> See, so got to get some phrases in there sometimes so you don't fall asleep. You know what's happening. It catches your idea. <laughs> Jesus was a fisherman. And he told Peter, I'm going to make you fishers of men. No longer fishing for fish. I'm gonna, you're going to fish for people. For their souls. For their, their lives to, to be saved from a place called hell. But what you want to kind of look at is before that is in where... I want to go back to the marina. Back into the marina. They, they, in the marinas, there's usually known for yacht clubs. The original, when you look back and do a research on yacht clubs, yacht clubs really were, were made and formed by people that were about rescuing. Their whole thing was a group was, what we're going to do is we're going to get in our boats and we're just going to cruise and we're just going to keep an eye out for anybody needing help. Broke down boat, somebody drowning, something happened, they need help, something like that. And that's what, they, that's what the original yacht clubs were all about. They were all about there getting in the boats going, hey, somebody over there, they're waving, you know, and they're finding the people out there and they're rescuing them and helping them out. And then they would go back to the to the marina and just sit around and tell some stories, get get refreshed with something to eat and something to drink. And they would be right back out in the boats, back out there looking for somebody. That was the whole point of a yacht club back in the day. But it seems just like, you know, the monotony of that driving, driving and stuff like that. And it's just like, oh, we didn't get see nobody. Uh, drowning or hurting today so it was like it's like maybe got boring or something like that and so ended up they ended up building buildings and just saying you know what we're just going to hang around here sip some champagne eat some caviar and then the yacht clubs became more about buying bigger boats and hanging out at the club and watching the boat sit in the water never go out into the water and having parties on the boats and just being there it's almost here's that this the picture of the church the church is all about, well, let's get bigger buildings and let's hang out here. Let's have our, our Sunday, fourth Sunday of the month dinner after church and just sell it's just fellowship and hang out and just, you know, get to know each other. When lost people all around the people that are coming to church are dying and going to hell. But you see, the church is not a yacht club. The church is a rescue society. We are to be like Jesus. Jesus is out and all about the rescue. It's like this. Jesus is like this ring. This is called a life ring. And in that when somebody's drowning, you throw the life ring out into the water and they grab a hold of it and then you pull them in to save their life. The life ring is Jesus. And he is all about saving lives. He saved yours. Maybe today you're looking, you're not saved, and you don't know Jesus Christ is your, your Savior. Today is this word is for you to say he wants to save you. He knows your situation. You're drowning. You're just so going underwater about everything that's happening in your life. And he's saying, reach out to me. I will get you i will save you but you see a lot of things in in life it's like going to the store when i when when, when i want to go purchase this thing to, to use it as the demonstration you can see some of the the like in boats they have the little uh what would you call them little cushions that you sit in the boats and you can sit on them some of the cushions are they say uh you can use them as a like a life floating device if something happens and you get in a wreck on a boat, you can use them. But some of them don't. Some of them are not floating devices or to be able to use as cushions to be able, you would grab a hold on it thinking you're going to float and then you would sink right down to the ground. But it seems as though it's like many of us and many people around us have bad floating devices, like possessions. Your, 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 your possessions of your home or your car 
or, or something like that, that it's in your life that you think you cannot live without this possession. You, you, you know, it's the idea maybe for pleasure. You're, you're looking, you're holding on to the pleasures of life, of, of doing things that make you happy. You're, you're relying on that to float, to hold you up, to keep you happy. When in reality, it's taking you down. It's, it's the things that, that maybe you think give you hope that takes away the pains of pleasures of partying, drinking, having sex with people, changing partners because this partner doesn't make you happy, this one does, and then just moving on to the next one. It's happening. How about positions? You thinking this job is going to make me happy. When you get to the job, you just want to kill everybody in the job. My favorite saying I hear one says, it says, I'm going to blow the place up. I'm just going to blow the place up. Nothing makes you happy. You're looking for this position, this direction. And they're bad floating devices. And it's taking you down. You see, we need to be like Jesus. Jesus is this. The radically rescue, rescue radically, Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is the lifesaver. He is the lifesaver. He is the one who come to save you. To be able to throw Jesus out. But the thing about it is, Jesus is not, he's not acting alone by himself in this. In the ring, as it's, as it's there, he has something attached to him. It's called the rope. What is the rope? The rope is the church. The rope is the hope. It is the one that it can be used as the church to be able to throw Jesus out there. And as they grab a hold of it, the people, the church, will pull and pull and help and be a part of it to be the hope that people's lives will be saved. How do you save someone from drowning? What is the, what is the ways that you can rescue someone? It's the ring. It's being able to know how to use Jesus Christ. It's being able to know how to use the ring to be able to throw him to those that are drowning, that are being lost. That they're, they're going down. To be able to sit down and maybe just to say, tell your story. How to sit back and say, you know what, I remember when I was sitting in a motel room. After going to church, being invited by my little girl. And the preacher was saying something that just kept stirring in my spirit about being lost. And that Jesus loved me, wanted to forgive me of my sins. And then sitting in that motel room, rereading what he had said that Sunday morning. And knowing the spirit of God was pricking my heart saying, I needed Jesus. I needed Jesus. I needed to ask for forgiveness of my sins. I needed to be saved. I needed to be cleansed. And then bowing my head in that motel room and saying, I, I, I've messed up. Please forgive me. I, I'll give everything up. I'm, a, I'm just going to, I'll give it all up and I'll be sold out for you, God. I'll do whatever you want. And that day, Jesus saved me. Then as the church would be able to, to be used To teach me more how to witness and how to love and how to care for those that are lost. You know, see, because the crazy thing is, is, is that a lot of times the longer you're saved and a born again, the less non-Christians you know. Because it seems as like what we do is we start alienating. I mean, I understand there's a, there's a point in life where you say, I... I I need to keep my distance from them because they're bad. But on the other hand, you need to stay in touch with them because they need Jesus. I mean, because I think of it this way. You know, there's, some, there's a group of people that, that one time I think of this story. This story is what I, I, I'm involved with this, this group of people. And then that group was somehow or another. I ended up over at their house at the wrong place at the wrong time. And the next thing you know, I've got a warrant out for my arrest for trespassing. 
And all I was doing was helping somebody. You're going like, pastor? Like, yeah. <laughs> My wife, too. She got one, too. Yeah. So, but the idea is of thinking about this. How do you, how do you react? How do you interact with those people that are lost that mean harm to you? This is hard. This is hard for me, and this is hard for me to preach this. Because I am about to say, you know what? Life is simpler if we just all stay together as a little clique. If somebody comes in and they're new and they're saved, then we'll disciple them and, and just kind of just take them in under our wings, whatever. But that's not the way Jesus is. Jesus hung out with those that were not saved. How did he do it? He's Jesus. How are we going to do it? We need Jesus. Because I don't know about you, dealing with people that are unsaved are, are, are absolutely people that can get on your nerves because of their evilness. But the whole point is that they need salvation. It's all about the church and the rope. To be able to throw Jesus and to pull on the rope. That is the hope. To be able to pull on the rope so that the house will be full. Galatians. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 reads this. Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father. Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Isaiah 19, verse 20. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender, and he will rescue them Jesus is the rescuer he is all about rescuing us he's all about rescuing those that are lost in, in, in their sins but are we are we the people that are like in the yacht club sitting back drinking our cheer wine sun drops and cokes and just socializing having fun while people that are in our eye shot right at the horizon in the water ch ch drowning chasing their boat chasing their possessions or their positions or their things that that, that life is bringing them down to be part of of the house of God is to be holding on to the rope of hope and pulling people in. Are you holding on to the rope and pulling people in? Oh, but pastor, you know, I, I got this going on here. Every follower of Jesus Christ, I will tell you, has an excuse. The devil has this little thing. He talks in your ear and whispers these things and he makes these excuses. Everyone, so here we got some excuses of why we as a church, why we as a people do not do the, the, the pulling of the rope, giving the pulling the hope for people to be saved and to be rescued. First off, we want to look at the first excuse we'll look at it, it is the sheeple excuse. The sheeple excuse is that we're, we're concerned about. We're, we're, we're more about what, what this says there. It says, those people I know have nothing in common with me. So I'm just not going to hang out with them. I think it's the thought of it like this. Why I call it the sheeple excuse is it because we're more like sheep. We just hang out and graze and look at each other and, nah, nah, and talk to each other. And we have nothing to do with the people outside. Because you know why? I, I don't want nothing to do with them. They, they're messed up. They got mental issues. They got drug issues, alcohol issues. They're just playing out evil, mean. 
But where we should be really about is the people. Not sheep, but people. That's why it's sheeple. We should be thinking about the people that in that position is saying, what if you were in their shoes? Then you would be there, and in a moment, in a flash of a, of a, of a, of a car wreck, you would die and they spend eternity where? Not in heaven, but in hell. How about this one? The, the, the safety excuse. The safety excuse. We, don't, we won't take the risk of leaving our comfortable lives. I, I like it the way it is. I, 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 know, I know this. I can use this. I would want to use this excuse. But I don't. My house is in turmoil since 19, no, since 2000. There's always been something God has been bringing from children, baby, little children, to adults, to old adults, that come to the house, that bring their mess of their bad choices and their consequences, and they bring it, and it interferes with the livelihood that I would like to have in my house. But I look what I do, and I say, God, if this person is not supposed to be here, then get rid of them. But if they're supposed to be here for a reason, then help me deal with it. And then that God has shown way to show favor to help them, to show them Jesus. And through the time, if they choose not to follow Christ, and then that time God sees fit, he does move them on. Sometimes it takes a year. Sometimes it takes two years. Some of them were four, five, and six, and some of them are still there. <laughs> So in that, to tell you your excuse of saying, well, I, I just want to stay safe. I want to stay tied up to the docks. I, want to stay, I don't want to go out there in the storm. It's too rough. I might fall over and drown myself. How can I help somebody if I'm already drowning? But you ain't even left the dock, so how can you say that? So another excuse. Another excuse that we're going to look at. The deep excuse. We're concerned about our own spiritual depth. All rescues happen in the deep, not the shallow. Spiritual depth is tossing the ring to those of Jesus who are drowning. Spiritual deepness in a lot of times is what people are saying. You know what? I just go to church and I'm going to read my Bible and do my devotions. I'm going to get deep with God. You want to do rescue? Maybe read your verse, go out and find somebody who's not saved, that's deep. Getting involved with people that aren't saved, that's deep, because that's where the rescue is. The rescue isn't in the shallow of being in the, in the church, of, of doing your Bibles and coming here Sunday mornings and reading the devotions all week long. The, 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 the deep, the rescue happens way out there. It's like you're at the beach. You, you, do, you see much, do you see much rescuing going on in, in the pee-pee pool? I mean the baby pool? In the shallow end? You know, the pee-pee pool, that's where the little kids go out here. Mommy, I got to go pee. Never mind. <laughs> no, no, the rescue is happening out deep in the water. When you're seeing a lifeguard pulling somebody in, it's because they went over their head and they couldn't handle it no more. They couldn't put their feet on the ground. And we're using the excuses of, you know, well, I kind of know more about Jesus. Well, you can know more about Jesus. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What did he do? He went and hung out with sinners. He went to their house, had dinner. And then he said, you know what? You need Jesus. You need saved. You need a Savior. You're sinning, and you're going to die in your sin. You're going to go to hell. He was straight about it, but he loved them when he was saying it. How about the excuse, the God in the box excuse? Well, I got God figured out. I got him figured out. You know what? Because he's only, you know what? He, in his word, I remember a preacher saying one time, because we're always remembering what the preacher said, but we never read it ourselves. The preacher said, you know what? He, he said that there, there, there's, God said that there's an elect that's going to go to heaven. So if there's an elect 
then why should I go out there and bother with all these sinners? Well, how do you know that you're one of the elect that ain't going to get go? Huh? If you're going to say that, we don't know who the elect are. But it's the opportunity of saying what God knows. He knows so much. And then that he knows if you're going to choose him or not. Who are you to say, I'm not going to bother helping or doing or doing that or sharing Jesus Christ because God's got it already figured out. Just when I'm thinking about saying, well, that person is a no good, gloss sinner. They're going to go to hell for real because they're stinking evil. Why should I even pray for them? And they, next thing you know what I turn around, they dig I'm saved going to church and bringing more people to church than I've ever thought they'd even bring it. Who am I to say that? Why can't we be the ones that saying, it's up to you, God. I'm throwing Jesus and I'm holding on to the rope. Are they going to grab on or not? It's up to you, God. I'm just going to do my part. We've got God in the box. How about this one? The no too much excuse. The no too much ex You know what? Some of us, some, there are some non-believers, well, I'm going to say maybe they were a believer at one time, but they don't, live, they don't live or act like it right now. They know more Bible than I know. They could, they could shoot off scriptures before uh, that, that just blow me away just to know that. But there's also non-believers that know the Bible pretty much. But you, could you imagine you as yourself standing on the boat, person's drowning and saying, let me tell you what the definition of water is in the Hebrew. <laughs> what good is that going to do with these sitting there going, bloop, 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 drowning? Sometimes you got to leave the definition of the Hebrew and the Greek. You got to throw that out the window and just be just be straight up from the heart. You know, to, to have a conversation with a person the other day, and as the person was like, you know, well, I got this problem, and you know, woe is me. And I can say, look, look, look. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, all I can tell you is this: this is what you're doing, and this is wrong. You need. To get some understanding and some wisdom and more prayer. Do that? Do they want to hear that? Absolutely not. But it's the truth that will get them in the right direction. Did I give them the Greek word about truth? No. I just told them they just need to seek God more. And they need to, to get some education on the situation more before they react. Sometimes we throw this excuse as, well, the Bible says, well, the Bible says, well, do you know, remember where you're pointing one finger at them? You got three at yourself. The Bible says, what about you? Huh? What about you? And then there's a, I don't know anyone who's drowning excuse. We don't put ourselves in situations where we are around non-believers. I think it was kind of cool that in this excuse that God has allowed me to stay working at a, at a roofing company where there's a lot of non-believers. And I sit in this room as they walk out the door and walk in the door because they got to go to their bosses and they always walk by me and I get a chance to speak to them. Hey, what's going on, guys? How you doing? All three of them, you know, and they're standing there. Hey, John, how are you? I'm like, doing good, man. How are you? And then they all of a sudden they get a chance to just pull them into the office a little bit, you know, with some, some work talk, and then switch the subject to God. Finding out that one of them is a believer, other two are not, which puts him in the hot seat that he works for these two, to be able to maybe share Jesus with them at one point or another. A challenge. God's allowed me to still do that kind of stuff. So to ask you that this, this point of, for you, where you're at, where are you at, that, that you are in a place that you are, are, are surrounded by sinners that are, they die today, they would go to hell. Because they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
that you can take Jesus and you can throw that to them. And then you as the church are the rope. You're the hope to be able to pull them in, to be able to bring them to church or to be able to share love or to be able to just say, you know what? I, I, I'll pray for you in your situation. In fact, let me pray for you right now. Is it okay if I pray for you right now? I'm going to tell you what, 99% of the times whenever you say that for somebody, they're going to say yes. Why? Hope. Your prayer is going to bring hope to their situation. Rarely, rarely do it ever target. We're in target. And we run into somebody and we hear the story. Oh my gosh. Tear jerking story. Horrible story. And I just feel on God just saying, just, just lay hands on this woman and pray for her. That's, all, that's exactly the words I hear from God. He was saying, lay hands on the woman and pray for her. I'm like, uh, but, and, and it's like she's ready to get out of here, ready to get out of here, cause it, maybe because the Spirit of God was coming in and she was feeling it, it was making her uncomfortable. I don't know. But everything changed when the opportunity said, can I pray for you? And she's like, yeah. I said, uh, okay, let's do this thing. And we prayed. We stood on God's word because God's word says, if you are twined together in three like a rope, cannot be broke. If two agree upon anything in Jesus' name, it will be given you. The power of God's word to be able to be brought into a situation through hope of people, the church, to pray, can change, save, Rescue a person, a family, a city. Jesus is our rescue. Philippians 1.6 I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. My friends, today you may know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you have people in your lives that are drowning from their sins. And if somebody doesn't throw Jesus to them, they're going to die in their sins. Do you want to see that? Maybe it's a change of how you pray for them. Maybe it's a way to pray even more for them. But it's a way to think of it saying, God, how can I get Jesus to rescue them? To ask that prayer. How can I? But still today is the point of saying, what about you? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Today, if today was your last day, do you Know that when you, wherever you go, if your breath, last breath would be today, that you would go to heaven. If there's doubt today, when I close, I want to end that doubt. By praying and asking Jesus, say, you know what? I don't want to doubt. I want to know. I want the rescue. I want Jesus to save me. I want the life ring. And in that, it's as simple as it when we pray, it's to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross to save me. I believe you raised from the dead to save me. Please forgive me of all my sins. I believe and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. You said you came to, to send the Holy Spirit to baptize us. So baptize me with your Holy Spirit. And I make you Lord of my life. Then after you get done praying that, make sure you tell somebody. Because his word says, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus himself will say to the Father, they are my children, they have repented, and he speaks your name. And then your name is written in a book of life with his blood that can never be erased. But it's for those that you don't know Jesus or you're unsure that today is the day for Jesus' rescue. As we pray, if you'll bow your heads. I want to take a second for those that are believers right now. 
You're thinking of some names that you know that need rescued. They need Jesus. In your breath and in your voice of your, your prayer voice. Because again, God hears your prayers with no moving your lips. Say those names to him right now. God, save them. God, send Jesus the rescuer to save them. Then in your prayers also ask, God, how can I be the rope, the hope of Jesus Christ for these people? How can I do that? Give me the tools that I need to be that. If you don't have no one around you, then God, I, then I challenge you this. God, this week, send one person in my life this week that doesn't know Jesus and help me share, throw Jesus to them and help me be the rope. I challenge you to do that. And for those that are here, you're watching and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as we pray, will you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins? And to save you and to baptize you with his Holy Spirit. As we pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus just to thank you for this day. Father, I stand on your word that it says if we lift up the name of Jesus, you will draw all men unto you. God, I pray for your anointing to be on this video, upon this room right now, and bring salvation. God, hear their prayers. God, forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died and was raised from the dead to forgive me of my sins. To pay my sin debt that I might be forgiven and washed in his blood and his righteousness. Save me right now. Baptize me with the Holy Spirit from heaven. Hear their prayer, Lord. And Father, for the church and the rest of the believers, Lord, help us. Help us throw Jesus the rescuer. Help us be the rope of hope to pull them into your kingdom, into the house of the Lord. God, I bless these people with the tools of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. For the evil that may be attacking them right now, Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus, Father, it says in Malachi, that you will rebuke the devourers for their sake. So God, I bless these all that are here and that are watching right now to rebuke the devourers, the evil that is trying to hurt them or steal from them or take things that, uh, of health or finances or spiritual or, or relationships with you or those around them. God, that you will rebuke that evil. Right now. God I ask you in the name of Jesus. That you will move in their lives like never before. To use their story. To share Jesus. And be hope. God I love you Jesus. I love you Holy Spirit. I love you. God bless these people. Bless those that have accepted Jesus Christ. Watching the video Lord. God and give them encouragement. To, to even maybe. To, to, to make a comment on the. On, below on the on the video or to share with somebody at your uh, in their family or call somebody up or just go next the, the next time they get to church that they, they'll go to a church god you'll just move in this in a mighty way of, of jesus i ask you god i just thank you can't thank you enough for rescuing me in jesus name we pray amen